thisiscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. This is your host, Fuad Kassab, and with me is a woman who's rushing to get back home, Joe Witten. <laughs> Don't say that. They'll think they have to hurry to listen and they'll put it in fast forward and it'll sound really crazy. Yes. Don't do that, guys, um, because you've got a <laughs> one and a half hour podcast. Maybe you should do that because it's going to be a long one. After. <laughs> put it in, in fast speed. The podcast that you're about to hear is with Jason Pro from the Human Longevity Project. Now, this is a docu-series that's available online. Um, it's available now in small batches for free, but you can also... Uh, purchase full access to it. And Jason, what he does is he goes and investigates all the different aspects of human longevity. And in particular, what's super interesting to me about what he did is he went and traveled and saw all these parts of the world where people live to be of an old age. And he um, shows them their lifestyle and how it is that they, um, they're living in a way that contributes to long long-term health and well-being and happiness. And having done all these things that he's done, he's come back with the collected wisdom of the people that he's met. And it's a really, really beautiful podcast. Highly recommend that you listen through to the end. It's just full of nuggets all the way through. Um, Joe wasn't on this podcast to um, uh, to, talk to Jason. It was just me and him. Um, So we geeked out on all the stuff that we were (laughs) talking and it was fantastic. So um, that would be uh, episode 114 of The Quirky Journey. And um, Joe, do you want to say some last words before we move on to the podcast? No, I think we, we don't really have any um, classes to announce yet. We're working on some more, but just stay tuned. Um, we, have, we always let you know in our newsletters if there's going to be anything in your area. Um, and, yeah, so we'll be in touch. All right. <laughs> Enjoy the show. Jason Pro, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Jason, you spent two years or so um, traveling to create this documentary called The Human Longevity Project. And um, that's a long time for a person to dedicate their lives to uh, a task as noble as this. I'd love to hear what the documentary is about. Well, yeah. And if you uh, if you told me it was going to be a two year project that when when we started, I, <laughs> I may not have gone forward with it. So <laughs> sometimes you just don't know what you're walking into. Um, Sometimes it's better that way. I think it's necessary. Exactly. Um, no, we, we, we started off um, just with, a, with an idea to further explore longevity with um, a little bit more of a scientific mindset, um, and, but also with a, a view on the future. So if you look at a lot of the longevity research out there, you, you find generally two things. Uh, maybe actually you find three things. One is you have researchers looking at the mechanisms that they think are involved with aging, right? This sort of biological process of aging. And they're basically in the lab or they're looking at research or they're analyzing biological systems and trying to figure out what is the key or keys to aging. And then the other side of the research um, primarily is is the study of the past, right? So you have um, people that have uh, in certain areas or, or, or certain types of people or groups that are living um, a long time and doing so in a healthy way. And so you have researchers and, and you know, demographers looking at, at, at those people and trying to figure out what, are they, what did they do or what are they doing to live a long, healthy life. And then you have a third group of people that are health futurists, right? So they're looking toward the future and they're, they're coming up with these ideas of how can we end death? You know, can, is, is aging a disease that we can cure, right? And so... I think what we noticed from my perspective is, is that they're all three looking at different things, but they're all kind of missing the point, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and from my perspective, um, working in the chronic disease model, working with people that have lots of chronic disease issues, what I noticed was that we're not really, you know, in the modern world, in the Western world, we're not really living in alignment with our world anymore. We are living inside. We are living with technology. We are away from the, our roots uh, in terms of you know, our humanity. And so what, I, what we really wanted to explore was you know, 
why don't we look at the past and look and see what people did in the past, explain why that was useful for health. And then with that basis, you know, mix in some sort of philosophy and, and, and newer modern health sciences that we're now understanding about the body and use that as a template to guide our future. Because right? I think this is the thing that I think is really, really key. If we want to t- talk about longevity, you know, for people like us, how do we live healthy? How do we live a long time? Given that we are now going in, you know, we have been for a while, but we are now even more so going into an environment that is totally foreign compared to what, what we've been exposed to for the, for the past few thousand years. Right? So to me, this is the key question that we need to ask and understand and learn how to navigate because computers aren't going anywhere. Cell phones aren't going anywhere. It's only going to get crazier and we're only going to probably, you know, naturally uh, be, be guided inside more and in this kind of weird modern life. How can we navigate this going forward with an understanding of the past? Uh, advocates of science are often heard saying things like, um, we are living longer than ever now. And um, that all because of uh, medical advancements and things like that. And I'm just wondering with your view on this, like doing a documentary on aging, um, it seems that your view is a little bit contradictory to theirs. I'd like to understand where it contradicts that view, if it does, and what your take on where we are now as people and how we're aging. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I came from, originally, I came from the sort of uh, mechanical engineering, mathematical world, right? So I was really into statistics and mathematics and all these things. And what you realize is that, you know, what you just mentioned is true. You know, statistically, we are living longer than before. And this continues to to improve globally and and also in most countries. The thing is, is that these are statistical games that we're playing. Mm -hmm. These are, they're not a description of how we're living. So just because we're living longer doesn't mean that we're living better, right? And, and just a, an obvious case in point, um, you know, people, people may be living longer, but they're spending the last 10 or 20 years on medication, in pain, suffering, you know, um, in psychological or emotional pain, spiritual pain, whatever the case may be. And so just because the number of, of years might be, might be ex- extending does not mean that we're living a better life or more harmonious life and or that we're at risk of sort of sliding down the other side of that. And this is what we're seeing in the last few years. This happens every now and again, um, you know, but, but it's really started to happen in consecutive years now in the United States, which is that we are now projected to live shorter lives. Younger people are now living project, projected to live shorter lives than their parents. And part of this has to do with the opioid crisis and epidemic that we have. And to that, I would say, why are we taking so many opioids in the U.S.? Mm-hmm. Why are we uh, Why are we numbing so much pain? Why are we in so much pain? You know, so there's lots of questions that that go quite deep and way beyond these sort of statistical measures of how many years we're living. And so, you know, I think we have to look at not only the number of years, but what's the quality of life that we're having right now, and why is it that despite all these modern advancements, why are we still not living maybe as healthy as some of these people in, in many parts of the world, you know, that are living maybe a, more, a slower, more, more, um, let's say natural life, if you want to put it that way. Mm. You went and traveled around the world, um, focusing on these areas that are considered in the blue zones. Is that right? Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that, um, part of that was we just went to these areas because, It allowed us to, um, you know, we knew that they were sort of more densely populated than other parts of the world. So if you want to go speak to 90 and 100 year olds that are healthy, go to those places. But but the reality is, is that we were not studying a location per se. You know, to me, it is not a location thing. In other words, it has has very little to do with geography. I think there can be a case made for islands because primarily because, you know, over the past hundred years, islands are places where you know, you basically have a strong genetic heritage that is optimized for that environment. You have, you know, the culture that remains. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, uh, it's not exported, if you will. You know, you're, you don't have this emigration of, of, of cultural customs and these type of things. So you have a strong cultural heritage. So there's, a lot, there's something to be said for islands, I think. But, but that's, that's more nuanced. Ultimately speaking, I don't think the keys to longevity have anything to do with locations. 
So we just wanted to go to those places to, um, to use those because there's some familiarity in, with those regions. Um, and we can use that to sort of open the discussion points of what, what health is. Because that's really the question. You know, it's not a matter of how long do we live, I don't think. I think it's a matter of how healthy can we live for as long as possible. And so those areas are, are interesting in that regard. The other interesting part was that, you know, I had a suspicion that these sort of blue zone areas that have been recognized for a while, that some of them may not be blue zones anymore. And this is fairly confirmed when we were there. Right. You know, they, in other words, they've changed so much um, that they are no longer these hot spots for longevity. And this proves my point exactly, that it is not this, it's not that these areas are special. It's not that they have supreme genes. It's the habits, the lifestyles, the cultural practices, the wisdoms, and the way of life that, is, that matters. And once you start to change that, which is exactly what we found in Okinawa, that it's a totally different life now than it was 50, 60 years ago, mm. then you start losing the health. And this is exactly what we're seeing. This is um, reminds me so much of the work of Dr. Weston A. Price. I'm sure you're familiar with his work because in, in a way you're kind of uh, not retracing his footsteps, but doing something similar to what he did in visiting these traditional cultures around the world and focusing on the ways that they're living. His focus was mostly on nutrition and the food that they were eating. But what he saw was as soon as civilization started entering those areas a little bit more seriously, then there was a degradation in the health of the population. And he attributed it to a loss of eating traditional food, things like uh, the period of gestation, um, and the nutrition that the mother was uh, having during um, child, like before childbirth, during pregnancy. But um, what I hear you saying is this is seems to be only one factor, um, like the just the loss of um, traditional food there. That there might maybe also other aspects are entering these areas are causing a deterioration in terms of longevity. Is that what you've seen? Yeah, and, and you actually bring up a really good point. I, I love Dr. Price's work. I love his whole approach. Um, and we actually covered some of his material in, in some of our film. Um, and, and here's the thing. He, he was going around in, what, the 30s and 40s, I believe, um, around the world. That was a much simpler time. Yes. Right? So think about, the, let's just call it 1935, right? This was pre-television. This is pre-radio. you know, radio. This was pre you know, TV. Uh, computers and cell phones and uh, most uh, electricity in many parts of the world. Um, this was pre refrigeration. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it was a totally different life, you know, no plastics. I mean, it, even the chemical and plastic revolution hadn't happened yet. That was mostly a post world war II phenomenon. So they lived in a completely different environment. So this is the key factor. And so, and, and yet he, you know, he was, he was had the same type of questions. What is it that we're doing wrong? And now, when, if he were alive today, and, um, and let's say he was sort of on this journey with me, I think he would, he would be asking the same type of questions and recognizing that, oh my God, this is, the world has changed in a, a dramatic way. And to me, this is the important recognition if we want to look at somebody that's 100 years old today. Right? That means they were born in 1918. So you know, we have to recognize that they grew up in 1918 Costa Rica or 1918 you know, uh, Sardinia in the mountains, you know, that is a completely different situation because yes. most of their life, they lived without electricity. They lived without refrigeration. They lived without cars. They lived without any of the technology, no chemicals. So we can't look at their life and say, okay, they're eating beans and they're doing these things. And I mean, yes, some of that we can, we can recognize. Um, if, if anything, what we can use that is, is we can use that as a model to poke holes in our current thinking. Because mm. right? there's some people out there that say, oh, beans are bad because they have lectins and phytates and all these things and they chelate minerals and all. And I'm like, well, then why did these people eat these things for 100 years and, and they're just fine, right? And they're living really healthy. So if anything, we can use that as a way to poke holes in our current sort of nutritional theories. But what we have to recognize is that those people and the way that they lived is so dramatically different than the way we live today. And it brings me back to the point that we can never go back to be 1942 Okinawa, you know, mm. we, we, nor would we really want to. They lived a hard life. And so I think we have to be careful that we don't glorify their, their, rough, their you know, sort of meager, modest existence that was primarily based on doing things to survive and comparing that to our life today where I'm sitting here on a computer talking to you over this, 
you know, electronic program and we're broadcasting around the world, right? So we have a lot of opportunity. We have a lot of um, choices to make. They may not have had as many choices. So they were for forced, if you will, to live a more natural, harmonized life that was in tune with the, the seasons and, and the timing of nature and all these things. Whereas now we have to, we have to make choices. You know, it, I don't have to go outside today. I don't have to go outside for a month and I can still live a normal life, quote unquote. But back then in 1948, Costa Rica, your entire life was outside essentially. You know, even when you're in diet, it, it, indoors, it was mostly open air and all these things. So this is the key factor. There are so many points to consider when we talk about health and longevity that, and, and I would agree with Wes and Price that, that, that pregnancy, birthing, even the birthing process, right? I mean, so let's, let's forget about the nutrition of the mothers. Yes, of course, that's important. We know that. But what about the birthing process itself? We're doing that in hospitals. We're, we're swabbing down our, our, our children as soon as they come out the, uh, you know, of the vagina. We are clipping the, the umbilical cord, clamping it. We are sh- cutting off the blood supply to the baby. You know, I mean, there's just, there's step by step before even touching the breast, if they, if they are breastfed, yes. that we're doing so many things that are different from 150 years ago. Now, I'm not demonizing all these things. Sometimes we have to take, you know, we have to take medical approaches to pregnancy and to birth, but we are now making that the norm as opposed to the exception. And so... Part of this, we have to recognize that there's a cruel reality in nature that we, we don't like to admit or face, which is that if you take away medical interventions, a lot of people die young. So I don't want to, in Darwinian terms, we might call those the weak ones, okay? I don't like to think of it that way, especially when we talk about humans, but, but hopefully it gets the point across that if we didn't have, and this is probably what, what we saw in a lot of the part of the world, because they didn't have medical interventions, a lot of people didn't have a chance at even living a modest life, a long life of any kind. They died young. Because, but now we have antibiotics. We have all these amazing tools to help possibly extend life for people that may not have had that opportunity before. So if you think about it in those terms, the, let's say, weaker ones may not have made it. And instead of dying at 72, which is maybe what we would call a short life, they died at six you know, but the stronger ones would make it, right? So now we're just having, we're bringing along more of the population. So I, I, so I don't think we can look at numbers and just look at things that way. I think the key that we have to recognize is how can we get everybody to live as long a life as possible and in, in an as healthy way as possible? And I think if we all look around and, and at the people that we know in our communities, we're not there yet, you know, mm-hmm. so we have a lot of work to do. So um, I hear you saying that it's, it's not beans that's the solution. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but this way, and actually, <laughs> even though it's a joke, it's actually a really good point that you made. The, the, and the point is this: we cannot oversimplify health. It is not about drinking wine. It is not about eating beans. It is not about just you know community and purpose and these type of things that have been expounded. It is about you know pre-pregnancy care. It is about pregnancy care, birthing in the right way, raising kids in an environment where they're not going through traumatic experiences because childhood traumas, emotional traumas is probably the, the most important factor for health or disease. You know, it's about raising kids uh, and, and, and even adults with meaning in their life, right? So I think meaning is probably more important than most things. Well, look at where we're placing our meaning right now. We're placing meaning in celebrities, in sports teams, in politicians, in vegan diets or paleo diets, we are placing our, 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 our emotions and our meaning in very strange places right now. Mm-hmm. If you talk to these people that live around the world that are in their 90s and 100s and ask them where their meaning was, it was in much different places. It was much more aligned with nature. It was much more aligned with humanity. It was much more aligned with God or, or, or the universe or however you want to think about that. So. And it was much more in the place of family and connection, you know, and our family units, I can only speak of what I see in the U.S., but it's completely dissolved. You know, we do not have strong family units, especially as we get older. So our meaning and what we're, what we're, how we perceive life is completely changed. So this, the, you made a great point. We cannot oversimplify things. We have to look at the big picture, look at everything from the small, you know, from, from preconception to 
to old age and what we're doing along that entire process. And so we are now, because we are now living in such a foreign world, if you will, we are, we are inside, we're, it, the temperatures are always stable, we're eating foods out of season, we are chemicals, everything is so different because of this. We have to make concerted efforts and bring a lot more awareness to everything that we're doing. And part of that awareness has to have a back, uh, you know, sort of an underpinning, which is how did we do this before I was around? You know, how did humans live? And so they didn't live like we are now driving cars. They live in much different ways. And we have to get in touch with that, I think, if we want to have a shot at good health as we get older. I look at um, health and longevity in terms of resilience. That's one of the, the key areas that I focus on. Um, there's this ancient symbol of the uh, snake eating its own tail, which yes. is, is this admission uh, on behalf of our ancestors that life eats itself. And this is something that happens within our own body. It's sort of a, a process of decay and rebirth that's going on in our body all the time. And um, I think of people who live to be a hundred to be resilient within their biology and their attitudes. And I'm wondering if you have found that to be the case on your travels and did you see an attitude of resilience and an environment that fostered resilience in a human being? Absolutely. Um, there's a concept um, that, that is very much tied to resilience called hormetic stress, right? And, and you're probably familiar with this, but for those who aren't, it's this idea that a little bit of stress is good up to a certain point where it's really making you strong or resilient. And then if you get too much stress, it starts to sort of cause problems. You know, this is the idea of exercise, right? You're, you're actually putting your body through physical stress at, to the point where it's going to, your body goes, okay, this is tough. We have to, we have to respond. We have to, we have to grow new muscle. We have to do these things in order to survive this stress. And so you become stronger, right? This is what we see with plant chemicals um, like like the allicin and garlic and, and you know, all these sort of phytochemicals and plant compounds that we see are actually stressors for our biology. And the body goes, whoa, you know, what was that? You know, that was a, that was a toxin. That was a plant toxin. We're going to have to, you know, provide these antioxidants, turn on this system, turn on that, right? So, so these are the type of things that I think we can look at from the micro level or the macro level. And, and I think you hit it on the head um, that it is in the it is in our daily living. It is in our mental you know, approach to life. It is in our um, emotional approach. You know, we have to have this sort of resiliency. And this is something that we did. We, we found it was very common in, in these societies, right? So, um, you know, sunlight is another good example of this, right? This is where you want to get sunlight. It is very beneficial for you to get sunlight on your skin. No matter what skin color you are, you need to have sunlight on your skin for a variety of reasons. And However, if you get too much, that, that excess radiation is uh, going to be harmful. You know, we actually saw this in Greece on the island of Ikaria. They have um, these thermal baths that have radon, you know, this radiation. Um, this mm -hmm. is you know, nuclear radiation, basically, but it's in small amounts to the point where it's turning on mechanisms in the body that are beneficial. Mm -hmm. So you, you create resiliency. Now, here's the thing about resiliency, I think, you know, um, uh, I don't know how big you guys are, but I would imagine that if I put, um, you know, 250 kilograms on a bar and told you to squat that, you probably are not going to do it. It's probably going to crush you. Forget it. No. Uh, never. It's definitely crush me. <laughs> yeah. Now, but if I put, you know, 50 kilograms on a bar, you have no problem with that. So the point of resiliency is a matter of you as a person. Mm. There are people that can, that can squat 250 kilograms. No problem. You know, they exist out there. It's because they've trained up this resiliency to the point where that's now their sort of resiliency threshold, whereas yours and mine is less. We can think about that in the phytochemical world, in the sun world, everything else, all these little hormetic stressors. We each have our own sort of threshold, right? And, and if we, are, if we go, go beyond that, then it's too much. Mm -hmm. And exercise is probably the perfect example of this in our modern world. We are exercising in crazy, weird states now the point where many of us are exercising too much. You know, if, if we're exercisers, we're exercising too hard, too much, too often, and in ways w without the recovery. Now, if you get great recovery and you're, you're, you're exercising in a, in a sort of sustained way, now you can build this resiliency. So, you know, resiliency is something and this hormetic stress is this point where it's unique to each, each, each of us. And we have to sort of keep moving the mark in order to understand what that is, right? 
Um, another good example would be on the mental and emotional side of things. You know, somebody like a Navy SEAL, right? Somebody that's sort of military trained person is probably really, really resilient mentally and emotionally um, with because of all the training that they go through in terms of avoiding death and staying calm and, you know, being, you know, active in whatever they're doing. Whereas somebody that's untrained, their mental or emotional resiliency may not be as strong, right? So we have to recognize where those points are for us, engage them, but also recognize when we're sort of going over the edge. So what, what factors did you see or like what things were they doing in these areas that created resilience in them? I mean, the thing is they didn't have a choice, right? Yeah. So they had to engage their environment, whatever it was. You know, a lot of these people um, were, you know, in the time they grew up were dealing with World War II or with civil wars. And that brought famine, you know, that brought legit famine where they were not eating a lot of food. There was armistice. There was like sort of rationing of food to the point where, They, you know, we talk about intermittent fasting in the health world, or maybe even longer fasts of two or three or five days. Yes. <laughs> I mean, these people were eating very, very little food for like months on end, That's true. you know, um, because of the war. So there was all kinds of challenges that they faced. You know, um, a lot, some of them were shepherds and these type of things where they would walk 30, 40 kilometers a day. Mm -hmm. wow. You know, so they were faced with different challenges than we're faced with today. You know, today we're trying to get 10,000 steps in and we're, yeah. we're trying to count it, yeah. you know, and then we're going to put it on a, a spreadsheet or connect it with a police <laughs> you know, yeah. This is the laughable life that we're yeah. living compared to them. It's yeah. not even close. So, um, so there, there was a number of things, you know, and, and when, you're, when you're in an environment where, you know, let's say you had a, a strong summer and it destroyed the crops, you know, you're going to go through mental challenges yeah. and hunger and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, uh, they were, they, they were just under, I mean, another good one is, um, in Costa Rica, they would, they would often get dengue fever. You know, this is an infection, um, where here in the United States, we'd probably give antibiotics, maybe some, um, IV. I, I don't really know. I don't know what the protocol is for that, but I know it's not good. You definitely go to the ER and they, there, they would just give papaya leaf tea for a few days and let it clear. Yeah. So, So they, they let their system immune system was trained, yeah. Yeah, but, but they weren't afraid to that. They, 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 their immune system was sort of trained and they were using the plant world to sort of assist. Yeah. Whereas we are afraid of our, everything in, in, our, in our natural world. You know? well, so, I've, I've heard you talk um, on different podcasts and um, one point that you make is like these small communities actually get uh, fitter for their environment because they've been uh, within that gene pool for a while. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and this is more my theory, you know, this is, I wouldn't say this is totally uh, yeah. accepted theory, yeah. but, but sure. I think that there's a couple of things we have to recognize, you know, that we have a number of gene systems that, that we have to talk about. We have the human genome, right? And this is what we're all familiar with. This is what we've, we've mapped recently, and we have about 19,000 genes. That's, a, that's the most recent count, somewhere in there. By the way, rice plant has, uh, has more genes and an earthworm has more genes than we do. So we're not all that special in terms of our protein coding genes. Um, so that's one aspect of, of genes that, that are involved with our physiology. The other aspect is our, our, our virome or our, you know, our, our, our biome, our microbiome. So we have bacteria and viruses and fungi and yeast and all these things that are within us and on us that have their own genomes. And that is much, much greater than our own human genome. In fact, they carry out most of our function. There are, met, there are more cells, there are more genes, and there's more activity in those genomes that, in, that are involved with our health than our own genome. Mm -hmm. So we have the interaction between those genomes and our own human genome. And then we have another, a third set of, of sort of genetic variable in there, which is our mitochondria. And mitochondria are what we typically think of as the energy powerhouse of the cell. You know, there are these little organelles that live inside the cell and they basically make ATP. They send out reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress. They communicate to our DNA. There's all kinds of signaling molecules. Mitochondria are very, very important, especially when it comes to aging and functioning of the body. In fact, a lot of the cancers that we see out there are due to, a, to mitochondria that are not working well. In other words, they're not turning oxygen uh, and substrates into ATP. And so therefore they get hypoxic. So that's, that's a big component of our health. So you have mitochondria, mitochondrial genes, and they have their own genome. You know, they, they literally have their own genome, their little circular DNA. Sure. So they have their own genome. We have our genome. We have the bacteria and viral genome. 
they're all three talking to each other. And we know this now. We know that they communicate. We know, we know some of the mechanisms by which they communicate. And then we have another component to this, which is our food. So the food has its own genome, right? We have genetic material found in food and genetic material found in the bacteria and the viruses, et cetera, in our environment. So what we have is we have genetic components in the environment that are talking to all three genetic components within us and they're all synchronizing. They're all sort of working together, if you will. And our, our, our bacterial and viral genome that's in, in and on us, that what I, I like to think of them as short-term sensors of the environment. So you can think of them as what things that are there to help our human genome understand the environment. You know, are you eating sweet potatoes or are you eating elk? You know, um, are you eating you know, uh, oranges or are you eating strawberries? It, so, so these things help us, and what, what's in the water that you're drinking? They help us understand the immediate environment very quickly. You know, is there no food? Is there lots of food? Are you eating root vegetables or are you eating fruits, right? These type of things. And then the mitochondria and the human genome are more slow. Um, they, they sort of read the environment more slowly, hmm. right? So, so the other, and the thing about genes and genetics you have to, that we, I think we have to recognize is that they are adaptive, right? Our genes adapt. This is why we have white people and, you know, darker skinned people and sort of the Asian people and Indian and South American and Central America. We have all these different people that we can sort of visually recognize as quote unquote different looking. And that's because the, their genomes have adapted to their environment. And so, you know, we know this now because we've studied mitochondrial genomes and Douglas Wallace was sort of the first to point this out. He may win a Nobel prize for this work. It's so important that the mitochondria that, which only come from our mothers, that they, he noticed that they, he, he mapped the genetic changes throughout the world and sort of painted this picture of where humans went and how long they were there and what, and how they traveled. So we can actually sort of show the migration of humans across the planet based on this mitochondrial genome. That's really profound. So we have to recognize that genes adapt. They're always adapting to the environment. Is it cold? Is it hot? Is it a tropical environment? Is it an Arctic environment? You know, what's the pressure? All these things, they're, they're taking in these signals and they're, they're adapting so that they can be optimized for that environment, right? Because at the end of the day, all genetic material, in my opinion, wants to survive. So it has to adapt to the changes. Mm. And everything's always changing. So as humans walk about the planet, find new environments, eat new foods, interact with new you know, viruses and bacteria, all these different things that we're doing, our genes have to sort of adapt to that. And this is kind of what I like to think about in terms of you know, adaptation and, and, and long-term health. So if you have an island, let's say, um, that's a really good way to sort of keep the genome locked in, right? You're not, you're not mixing the genomes. And there's nothing bad with that. It's just that I think what you have is you have a genome that becomes supremely adapted to one environment. It specializes it. Exactly. And, and, and this, is a very, this, is, this would be a very Darwinian-esque type yes. of thing to think about. Um, and then you also have the culture that develops, right? This is, I mean, we have Italian cultures, we have Spanish cultures, we have you know, Russian cultures. We have all these cultures, right? These sort of ways that humans interact with their environment and things that they like to think and do and say, right? So this is kind of just culture. So then you have this culture that becomes very ingrained, very, very ingrained. It doesn't really leave. It doesn't get influenced by other cultures. So you have people doing the same things over and over. Their way of life is the same. And their genomes, their mitochondrial genome, their human genome, and sort of the bacterial or microbiota genome, they're all staying the same for a long period of time. This would argue for a very, very adapted genomic profile a metagenome that is ideal for the environment now if i took a you know a, somebody that was from sardinia and has a really strong sardinian heritage um and i moved them to okinawa and said okay well you've got great genes quote unquote let's move you to okinawa where everything is different they're probably not going to do as well that's true you know so and, and we know some of these mechanisms by the way and in fact a good example of this is the japanese where it was about 900 years ago or so we, we saw a horizontal gene transfer come from them eating a lot of seafood, a lot of like fish and this type of stuff. A bacterial enzyme transferred over 
into the uh, enzyme of the of the humans that allowed them to digest seaweed and you know these sort of sea vegetables. Mm. Mm. And so they are more specifically adapted to, um, to to metabolize and digest those things than maybe people from other cultures. And we see this with with the Indians. The Indian culture is better uh, at, at metabolizing you know, things like turmeric, right? Turmeric root, because they have a long history and tradition and cultural use of turmeric in their dishes. So I think it's really cool. This is, this shows us that we're all the same, but we're all very different. And it gives us a basis for understanding why our genes are different and why they might be better at one thing and and less good at another. So, you know, it, it gives us an understanding of maybe our cultural heritage is, um, something important to consider, but so is our local environment, right? I mean, I'm in San Diego, California. It's a really sunny sort of you know, beach environment. And my heritage is probably, you know, it's mostly Northern European. So my culture, my, cult, my heritage, my genetic heritage is very different than my modern environment. How do we navigate that now? I don't really have an idea. I don't know what is most important and how to understand that truly. But I think if we want to understand one aspect of longevity, I think that is interesting to look at. But it's still, we shouldn't use that as a scapegoat to say, oh, well, you know, they're special, therefore, screw it. I'm just going to live however I want to live. Because, you know, I think if you're, you're more likely to, you know, develop poor health if you're not being mindful of sort of this universal common aspect of human health, which, which we can't observe. This is like uh, what you're talking about reminds me of Michael Pollan's omnivore, omnivore's dilemma, where he talks about how because we are omnivores, the choices that we make in food aren't as clear as they say a dedicated herbivore or carnivore. So then add to that the complexity of the migration of someone like me who grew up, say, in the Civil War in Lebanon, came to Australia, or someone like you with a Northern European background living in the United States and now trying to figure out what the best thing to eat, as opposed to someone living in Okinawa and his whole generation, like generations have been living there forever. And um, it's much clearer for them to know what to eat. But I want to go yeah. back to this one point that you were talking about earlier about gene expression and the food and how it switches on certain genes, because this is yeah. a really important point. Real um, quick, real quick before you get to that, because you actually hit on something I want to address, which is yeah. that um, culture is so important. So, it, so again, yes, we can talk about genes and environments, but this, I think, it, this is, shows us the role of culture. The culture over generations and generations is the thing that teaches us how to live, how to eat, when to eat, what to eat, how much to eat, um, when to go to bed, w- how to pray, or how to meditate, whatever it is. That's the culture. That's right. And if you look at the United States, or probably even Australia, we don't have a very long historical tradition in terms of culture. So we've lost the, the tradition. This is the problem, I think. It's less of a problem in terms of environments. It's more of a problem in we're not being taught anymore how to live this life in our environment because we don't have a rich heritage. You see what I'm saying? So culture yeah, is critical. This is, uh, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about mythology and how that teaches people how to live within their own culture. And yeah. mythology is a set of stories. And if we've lost the stories and we really lost the guidelines that guide us in life in, in terms of how we live and talk to us about the seasons and the exactly. environment exactly. we live in. So it's... Um, you know, we can go into uh, deep discussions over all these topics for hours. It's incredible, really, because um, this is the, the bulk of my, my work as well, is sort of delving into all these areas um, to learn about them too. But um, one thing, just to give like a bit of a practical thing to the listeners um, to focus on this is if they're eating, say, you, you mentioned eating, like, say, lemon, oranges or apples or bananas or pineapples, and it's winter here now in the Blue Mountains and I'm getting um, apples and mandarins, for instance. They're, they're in season. They're telling my body that, hey, you're living in the Blue Mountains because I'm eating local apples and mandarins and that uh, it is winter time. And if you're then getting a pineapple shipped from, um, I don't know, the Americas coming here, then that's telling you that it's uh, summertime in the United States. So your body gets super confused as to when and where it is in the cycle of the seasons and the geography that can't really express itself in any useful way that is 
uh, going to be harmonious with your environment. And that's really one of the key aspects is for your body to be in harmony with this environment. Is, would you say that when you traveled around all these places, the focus was on locally grown and seasonal food? Yeah, I mean, they didn't have an option, right? Yeah. I mean, literally, they didn't get electricity in Costa Rica and in the parts of Costa Rica that we visited. They didn't get that until 1970. Mm. So if, if you don't have electricity, that means you don't have refrigeration, you don't have freezers. You are, you are operating on whatever is around you. So this is non-negotiable. It wasn't a debate. This is the thing we have to recognize right now. We are literally debating diets because we have the luxury to debate diets. Yeah, absolutely. Period. Yeah, yep. food. well said, because this is really like you, you hit the nail on the head there. I often talk about when someone says, you know, we should all be vegans or vegetarians. I'm saying this is like, this is the, the luxury of an affluent society that can actually make a decision as to what kind of diet it should be eating. Whereas for the entire human history, we had no option. We just ate what the land gave us. Right. And, and, and we, we've introduced so many uh, variables into this concept, right? So I think you hit on an important one, which is the seasons. Now, we don't have a mechanism to understand how seasonal foods affect us. And honestly, we have some suggestions, we have thoughts, we have you know, probably some logic that we can apply. But at the end of the day, we don't really know how that works, right? Um, there are people that claim to know, but here's, here's what I would argue. In a society that has the ability to eat foods out of season, this is the same society that has the, the ability to stay inside all the time and they're not in touch with their environment mm -hmm. anyway. Right. So, so I actually really like your point. I will counter with that, counter that and say, I would agree with that. If you are somebody that's living outside, you know, in the elements, uh, constantly in touch with the environment. So if you take somebody out of their environment, they're living yeah. inside, they're introduced to all kinds of different, you know, microbiota in their environment. They're not in touch with the sun. They're not in touch with the cold or they're not in touch with anything, the dark, the light, then do we even know? No. what the impacts are out of season, in season. So in other words, if we take your premise, which I actually really like, um, and, I, and I agree with the basis of it, but let's just say, okay, you take somebody living a modern life who's driving around in cars, who's wearing shoes, who's interacting with chemicals and toxins and metals and all these things and is stressed out nonstop and doesn't sleep well and is, has all this lighting at night and mm. they don't get darkness, they don't get quiet. And we say, okay, let's change your diet to a seasonal diet. Are we really expecting their body to now be in harmony? No, Probably. but, but right. for sure not. De definitely right. not. We, we're right. looking at it from all the aspects of things that can bring harmony. And of course, um, having a seasonal diet that is local to you is going to go some way into bringing harmony into the nutrition aspect of your biology, say. Like, but, hopefully, hopefully. But, and, 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 yeah. and, and I would agree with you. I, I mean, I'm 100% I'm supportive of, of your philosophy. I would, just, I would just argue that perhaps it's not really bringing the harmony that we think we're getting because how many of us are spending 90 plus percent of our time inside and not in touch with the local environment anyway and we're bringing all this artificial crap. Yeah. So in other words, what if you know, adding something like pineapples that's helping our, you know, produce some extra digestive enzymes, even though it's out of season, might be beneficial? Or maybe the celery, uh, because it has great mineral salts, um, is beneficial even though it's out of season. So this is kind of where I go back and forth. You know, I'm not sure. I don't know what the real answer is. Is it more important to, to develop harmony and in the food that we eat, but even though we have so much disharmony and everything else, or is it more important to just bring in more healthy foods because our environment, our, 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 our mindset, our emotions are so chaotic that anything healthy is better than you know, anything that's not and whatever you can get is going to be a good thing. And I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't know the answer to no, that. No, I, I hear you. I guess, I guess, you know, from this um, perspective, we're talking about um, looking at our cultural traditions and yeah. also the constraints of what our ancestors lived with. And to say that, um, you know, they only had access to local seasonal food and they also lived outdoors. Most of the time they breathed fresh air, didn't have the toxins, they uh, had hormetic stress from their exercise, they had strong community support, they had a sense of purpose within their community. As they grew older as well, the elders had a place within the community, so that contributed right. to their longevity. Um, right. all, all these things start uh, coming into play. Yeah, well, yeah. One of them is like an absolute, you know, like, um, hey, take that 
the pill of local seasonal food and you're going to live to be 100. There's no way that that's going to actually be the case. Well, right. And especially if, you know, you have a, a, a Japanese person living in Central Africa. That's right. right. If, yeah. if they're eating seasonally in Central Africa, does that really matter for them? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so and, we, you know, we're growing uh, non-local um, crops anyway. So like, <laughs> right. I mean, right. peas and apples, which weren't even growing here. So right. Like, uh, uh, honestly, so, so this is yeah. the discussion I've had yeah. in my head for some time. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> fundamentally, I'm 100% in agreement with you. Yeah. But here, here's where I think we can really um, – Here's where I think this is unequivocal in terms of the seasonal approach to food. The thing that seasons do is that they force variety. Mm. So imagine yourself in 1948, Ikaria, Greece. You operate on seasonal foods, and therefore you get lots of variety, period. There's no way around it, especially if you're outside and you're, you're basically using what the land is giving you. Yeah. You're, you're, you're going to get variety. How many people in the Western world eat maybe 10, 15 real foods a year. You know, everything else is sort of good, modified. It's, it's nonsense. It's not real food anyway. We're not getting a lot of variety, right? Because, you know, I love my steak and I love my strawberries and I love my whatever it is, right? And so this is where I think we can use a seasonal approach to introduce variety. And that makes a lot more sense than anything else. And I think that would still apply given, the, given our crazy modern world. So if nothing else, you know, seasonally rotating things, I think yeah. probably is a good idea anyway. I don't think, you know, having, getting your, your, you know, green powder thing that's made up of 52 vegetables that are dehydrated and you know, torn to shreds into a powder is the right approach. No. Now, there may be some argument for using something like that, but I think a better approach is to, when you're at the grocery store, buy as many new foods as, as you can. And, you know, the seasonal thing, if you can work that in too, great, you know, and then if you want to take it even a step further, start growing foods. And this will show you what's in season, <laughs> because if you're trying to grow something out of season, it ain't going to work, That's you know? Sad. So, so I think this is maybe the most important thing that I could say with regard to food, just start growing some food, whether it's in the, your backyard or if you're in an apartment, just get a pot or a planter and just start growing some things. Cause there's a lot of things that happen with that. One is you are understanding the cycle of food. You're understanding the seasonal flow, right? And this is the thing that everybody was in touch with in a lot of these places that we went and visited. They were in the rhythm of the seasons of the day of the cycles of everything of the cycles of the moon. They were in that seasonal rhythm. We have no rhythm. Our rhythm is, emails and Facebooks and Instagram and all this garbage, uh, what TV show is on, what sports season it is, you know, what the political cycle is. These are our seasons now. And we're not pay, paying attention to the rhythm of nature. And so just by planting a few foods, you can start to get into a rhythm of nature. You can start to appreciate how long it takes to grow a carrot. You know? And then when the carrot grows, you have an appreciation for, wow, okay, that was in the ground for you know, uh, a good six to eight weeks. I'm not throwing that away. <laughs> you know, I, I, t I saw how long that took. And now you, you, instead of washing it off, you can just wipe it off with your hands. You're getting the soil microbiota. You know, there's all kinds of things like that. I think just starting that process, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be, you know, even 50% of your diet. But just starting to do stuff like that will, will encourage you. It will give you confidence that you can do a lot more than you think you can. It's a lot easier than you think it is. And you'll have a greater appreciation for it. So, I think this is what I would like to see is mm. instead of getting mired in philosophy around food and, and dogmas and, you know, debates on what the hell we should all be eating. I think try growing some foods in season, depending on your local environment and eat those foods, period. Absolutely. Um, I've got so many questions for you. I'm just wondering how much time do you still have? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. So <laughs> Okay, cool. So, so you want to go a bit over the, the hour. So I'll, I'll keep, um, I'll just ask a bit uh, more about the food because this is really the area. Like I'm, I'm a chef. That's my background. I used ah, to be a cool. software engineer before and, you know, changed from that to, through my own health crisis. And, the, you know, I heard this, uh, mechanical engineers. So, you know, we've got parallel lives here and me. What's your favorite dish? What, what's, what do you like to cook? 
Uh, really, I love cooking over fire. Just cooking anything over fire is my, my favorite thing. I've got like four or five things that I, you know, fire pits and smokers and, you know, all sorts of stuff here in my backyard. And as long as I'm outside and cooking, I'm happy. I'm, I'm going to be building a pizza oven now. So I'm, you know, probably roast a baby lamb in it or something. See how and that's actually something that we've gotten away from too, is the cooking and the preparing the food. Right. And, and this actually gets into a lot of digestion and all that kind of stuff, because as you're cooking and preparing food, your, your hands are touching it. Now imagine you just picked a couple of things from the garden, right? And there's, there's, there's some chefs and cooks and, that do this, right? And they, they, and they have that. And they, you see, so now you're in touch with the biome of that plant. Awesome. And then you're cooking it, you're cutting it, you're roasting it, whatever you're doing. Now your brain is going, oh, it's coming. You know, this is really good. It's smelling good. It's looking good. Now your digestive enzymes are being produced. So you have this pre-cephalic phase of digestion that's already happening before you take a bite of food. We've completely lost touch with that because now I get on my phone, I open up Uber Eats, I order food directly to my door, and it's being thrown down the hatch as I'm doing something, uh, watching something on YouTube while I'm also you know, messaging somebody on Facebook. Absolutely. We've completely lost touch. So Absolutely. I think I'd say good on you for cooking. Keep it up. We need more of that. We need to teach people how to cook. <laughs> I think this is a really important aspect of health that we have lost because our culture has gotten away from it. What have you seen in terms of commonality of food between all these different cultures that you've visited? Um, are they uh, vegetarians, vegans? What are, what are they eating? Yeah, none of the cultures we visited were vegetarian um, or vegan. I mean, I, I think if you actually look around the planet, you're, you're, it's going to be hard to find a lot of vegans. Um, you know, other than in the Western world, because we have the, the luxury of choice. Um, you don't find a lot of vegetarians around the world even. You know, there's large swaths, of course, in India and other places. But, um, but in the, re the reality is most of the world is, on, uh, is omnivore. You know, they eat damn near anything. And it's based on what they have access to. So, you know, when you're in the tropics, you see a lot of people eating a lot of fruit. Now, why wouldn't you eat fruit? It's there. It's growing on trees. It's all around you. You pick it and you eat it. It's simple. It's free. You know, it doesn't take any work. It's, it's delicious. All around you. And it's wonderful. Yeah, exactly. And it's very good for keeping infections at bay. It's good for feeding your microbiota and your, in your gastrointestinal tract. It's good for a lot of things. Um, it's super easy to digest. So what you see is you actually see older people and younger people eating lots of fruit because it's very easy on the digestive system, right? Where somebody like that loves steak, that's a very tough thing to break down. So as we get into a 95, 100 years old, eating a steak is probably not going to be as beneficial as eating some fruit because your body can't metabolize and digest it. It's just going to create inflammation. So I think this is the thing we have to recognize is that everything has its role and we can't call something good or bad. So, you know, we see lots of fruits, we see lots of carbohydrates um, being eaten. So in Costa Rica, you know, you see corn and rice and beans, plantains, yucca, you see lots of fruit, um, you see a little bit of leaf, you know, leafy greens and salads, but not a lot. Um, mm. you see some meats being eaten, you know, primarily pork and fish, um, and then whatever's wild. So they would hunt lowland paca in, in Costa Rica. Um, pigs are easy because imagine you're, you, have, you're, you have your homestead, you have your farm, essentially. You know, you're, you're growing some foods, you have some wild foods around you. You can go hunt and fish and that kind of thing, but, but mostly your food is in your local environment. Would it be easier to have, you know, a... a a lot of cattle, you know, 10 cattle that you're, you know, using for meat source, or would it be easier to have a pig? You know, pig can be kept in a sty, you know, you feed it the leftover vegetables and stuff growing from your garden. And maybe in the winter you slaughter the pig. Yeah. Right. Super easy. Right. So, so, so that was common to the cultures as well. There's yeah. They, they might tie the pig to a tree. Yeah. I mean, this is just, they, they were eating, they, they were doing this stuff to live, you know, they would eat chicken eggs and these type of things. They would have chicken, you know, so just to put yourself in their shoes for a sec, you know, you don't have electricity. If they have shoes. Right, exactly. Yeah. In fact, they didn't wear shoes a lot of times unless there's a party. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so put yourself in their bare feet, right? And recognize that they lived a different life and they didn't have this, you know, diet book they're referring to. They just had what their ancestors ate and the things that they knew to, to cook and prepare and these type of things. And so, you know, they were eating lots of, um, let's say calorically dense foods. Maybe that's a decent way to say it. Um, in other words, if you're responsible for harvesting, hunting, preparing, gathering your own food, would you grow a lot of kale and chard and lettuce? 
No, no. Gonna it's going to be it's gonna, it, stuff if you can. Exactly, because that's going to take up tons of land. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of work, and it's going to not provide you with that much sustenance, yeah. you know, especially if you have a family of 10 or 12. Because remember, they don't have condoms back then, they don't have birth control, and they still want to have sex because they're human, right? So sometimes all that extra sex, you know, ends up in a lot of babies. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking 13, 18, 20 kids in a family. Wow. Kind of thing. Wow. You know, yeah. Mothers would really, really birth. So, um, so if you're going to feed ten people, you know, you're not going to be, you know, planting a bunch of leaves. You're going to be planting rice and corn and beans. You know, you're going to be harvesting fruit. You're going to be, you know, have a couple animals that you're either taking care of or you're hunting, you're fishing. You know, you need real food. You know, you cannot debate um, what is healthy. You're not making a salad or a smoothie. So, I know from uh, growing up in Lebanon early on, like um, greens, we used to go foraging for them. That wasn't sort of something we grew. We just went, exactly. uh, went out to the wild and got them. Like that. Exactly. And, and they're typically used medicinally or yeah. as, um, you know, something on the side, right? So, or, or, or they'll be used as a, as, as a way to season food, right? This is how most people, you, you, I mean, even today in modern cultures around the world, like if you have a salad in Greece, or salad in Croatia or Bulgaria, they're not going to bring you out this big pile of leaves. They're going to bring you quartered cu- you know, these little quartered cucumbers and tomatoes mixed with, you know, some peppers maybe or whatever, some right? Feta. It's like real vegetables. Yeah, and cheese. Right? right. So, so we have to recognize that, that that's not something that they did at anywhere that we that we live or we that we visited. Now, again, they did eat some leaves, but it wasn't it wasn't these big salads. Yeah. Um, and, and you, you know, in, in Costa Rica or in, in, in Italy and in, in Sardinia, we would see, you know, cheeses and, um, you know, mountain meats, if you will. Um, what about milk? Uh, not as much milk. Like they weren't drinking milk like we would in the West necessarily. It was mostly cheese okay. that, they would, that they would make. Um, and, and so they, they actually had a better understanding of preparing food. Mm. Right? So if you think about cheese, what, what we're doing is we're using the bacteria to um, you know, metabolize some of the sugars and these type of things to essentially pre-digest, yeah. right? And then we did that. We saw this with grains and breads too. Yeah. You know, they ate tons of bread in, in Sardinia. That was their main thing that they ate back in the day is, is really good, high quality breads. And so they prepared those differently. They had different grains that they used. I mean, it was a totally different animal. And even today they'll say, you can't get good bread anymore. So they ate breads, they ate cheeses, they ate tomatoes, they ate, you know, some pastas, but, you know, not as much as they maybe do in mainland Italy today. Yeah. Um, but they eat all kinds of things, right? And then Okinawa has got its own cuisines. But at the end of the day, they're all eating real food. They're all eating, you know, meats that were raised naturally on real foods with no chemicals and toxins and poisons and all this garbage, mm-hmm. um, you know, and they were eating in a way that made sense in terms of the timing, which I think is the, probably the, one of the most important things that we are screwing up right now. Um, in fact, it's something that I work on with clients. One of the easiest things I can do is just, I don't even change their diet. I just change when they have access to food. I'll mm-hmm. say, okay, don't eat, you know, eat, eat only in the hours between, let's say 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Nothing after that, or, you know, basically a 10 hour window, however mm-hmm. you want to move that around. Yeah. And that'll, that'll fix a lot of health problems just in and of itself. Sure. So they were eating during the day, never at night. You know, they weren't eating 12 meals a day. They weren't snacking all day, Um, you know, and they were eating enough to sustain them, but not to go overboard. Because if you're responsible for harvesting, growing, hunting, gathering, preparing all your own food, the last thing you're going to want to do is just eat more to eat more. You're not going to overeat because that just means you have to do more work. Yeah, right. and also like, you know, a full belly, like an overly full belly won't really let you do your physical work as much. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so, so you ate, and again, you're supplying a lot of food for a lot of people, and sometimes there's wars and famine and seasons. And, you know, I mean, trust me, I, I, I've grown food, you know, enough to know that sometimes the seasons suck and you don't get a good <laughs> harvest. That's and right. so it's not like you're rationing every year, but, but you also have to take the approach of, we're not sure what the seasons are going to provide. And you have to also remember that you don't have the option to preserve a lot of things. So if you have meats, yes, you can salt cure them and hang them up to dry basically in the sun to sort of make this sort of jerky. But you don't have, you know, a, a big ribeye that you can throw in the freezer, right? So, so again, we have to put ourselves in the historical perspective of these people. And 
they're not special. I mean, they're special, but they're not, this is how humans have lived for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. You know, we're the ones doing things weird. (laughs) So we have to recognize that. And so I think the more fresh, seasonal, you know, nutrient dense, real foods that you can eat in a moderate capacity and at the right times of day, that's your key right there. And, and don't be afraid of carbohydrates, you know, things like rice and even corn and beans. Again, if they're not genetically modified and they're not doused in, in toxins yeah, yeah. and, you know, you're preparing them correctly and you're chewing them and all these things, they are feeding your microbiota. You know, they are, they have provide, they're providing plant material, sugars and complex, you know, starches and carbohydrates that are feeding the, the microbiota in your digestive tract. Mm-hmm. These, these microbiota are then communicating to your cells and your DNA and your mitochondria and you know, your immune system, essentially. They are providing signals about the environment. In, and a lot of these things are producing something, like, something called butyrate, butyrate or butyric acid. And this is a fat, right? This is a fatty acid. So when you eat, let's say, white rice and your gut microbiota eat up that white rice, all those starches, they are producing fat. So it's, isn't it interesting that you can eat carbohydrates and plant material and fibers and your gut microbiota will actually churn out fat. And that, that fatty acid will heal colon cells. It, turns, it, it, it feeds your mitochondria. This is a really beneficial thing. It's good for the brain. It's good for all kinds of things. So we have to recognize that it's no longer this blood sugar game that we thought of. It's no longer this, you know, carbs are bad and all this stuff. There is no bad food. I promise you, there's no yeah. inherently bad food. Yeah, if it's real food, then it's real food. Exactly. And it's just your ability to eat it, digest it, tolerate it. And if you can't tolerate it, digest it, or eat it properly without issue, then that's, that's I don't want to put the blame on you, but that, that's your system that's not able to handle that. Right? A good yeah. analogy might be a wood chipper. If I have a quarter horsepower wood chipper with dull blades and I throw a massive log in this thing, it's going to jam up. Yes. Right? But yet, if I have a 30 horsepower chipper with razor sharp blades and I throw in, you know, a stick or a log and it's just going to turn into sawdust. So this is our ability to digest food. And this comes down to how how are we growing this stuff? How are we preparing this stuff? Are we chewing this food? Are we, you know, um, eating in an environment that is happy and healthy and with friends and instead of, and in the right nervous system state, the, the parasympathetic, the rest and digest state, or are we eating in a rush? angry, you know, not chewing, uh, processed foods, chemical laden foods, you know, at the wrong time of day. So again, we can't just look at the food and say, that's a bad food. Don't eat that. It's more like the whole process has to be analyzed. And if we just go back and look at a lot of these factors, you know, don't overeat, chew the food, be in a calm place, right? Be prepared to eat, eat the right times of day. Then all of a sudden it doesn't, get so tricky you know we don't have to look at food that way and your relationship with food with meals and you and you from a culinary perspective i mean i got it i'm just like i kind of imagine sometimes at restaurants that all these chefs are just sitting there back in the kitchen going all oh, these damn people with all their freaking food <laughs> restrictions and choices and yeah. so it's just so ridiculous i just want to cook good food right like it's like it's like i'm an artist but you're taking away half my palate right it's like so we've lost touch with our food and I think we just have to bring that back. And I promise you that a lot of people with food sensitivities and food issues, a lot of this can be resolved if we just learn to chew our food properly, eat slowly, not overeat, eat the right time, eat at the right time of day, and feed our gut microbiota. You do those things, all of a sudden, all these food sensitivities and this loss of what we call tolerance, it goes away. Mm. So, absolutely absolutely and this is like i came from a, a paleo background you know that's how i found my health eating a low carb paleo diet but then yeah. that was in 2011 and um, since my understanding of whole foods became deeper and deeper i started seeing the bigger picture is that hey there's for one thing there's a transfer of life force between me and the food that i'm eating like the food's yeah. actually giving me life and that's one big thing that no one really talks about there Right. Uh, because you know we're so busy with the science that we're not really looking at life force and energy that's coming into our body which is super super important to understand and then you know the question becomes what's the most vital kind of food that i could be eating and um, when people start looking at food from the perspective of vitality 
and then you know looking at the particulars of like how can I give variety for my microbiome, then things start really really sh- shifting very very right. drastically in them. And it doesn't right. mean that you have to be paleo or vegan or vegetarian yes. or low carb or anything like that. You're just giving your body these beautiful inputs that it will thrive on, and it starts right. shifting drastically. Exactly, and I think you can be paleo. But you just have to recognize that plants are important, the process is important, chewing food's important. All those things I just mentioned are important. So despite yeah. you can be vegetarian, same thing. Despite your way of operation in terms of which foods you're eating, are they organic? Do they contain any pesticides or genetically modified components? Are they seasonal? Are they natural? Are they whole? You know, these are the things. Are you chewing it? These are the things that I think we need to look at instead of this food versus that food, this diet versus that diet. And you actually hit on a really important component that we, we brought up in the documentary, although we couldn't go too deep on it because we had a lot of other things to hit, but this idea of live food. And it, it, on the surface, this sounds like a little woo-woo, kind of mm-hmm. spiritual BS mm-hmm. concept, but, but, but it's very simple, right? And, and here, here's what I'll say. When I buy an organic sweet potato, okay, and I let that sit in my cupboard for a little while, It'll start to sprout. That's right. Right? So what is that telling me? That's telling me that there's something in that that has an inherent life force still there. I don't, we, I don't know how we want to classify it or understand it or define it, but it's still there. I can see this, uh, the same thing when I have an onion and it sits too long. It'll start sprouting this little green thing coming out the middle. I'm like, shit, I got to eat this thing. Right? So there's inherent life force in that. Now, if I were to buy onion flakes inside a little jar that I use to season things, why doesn't that grow into anything? The life force is gone. How do we explain that? I don't know. Just like when I, you know, if, if somebody dies, there's no life force in that body. But it's still the body, right? So it's, it's kind of like, what is this life force? We don't really have a good way to quantify it or understand it. But when you eat foods that have this life force energy, then I think there is something to that. You know, so I think just moving more towards whole, live, real foods, and you can cook them or slant, or let you know lightly heat them and these type of things. That's totally fine. But let's get back to the roots. You know, these people in 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 these areas that we that we visited, they weren't eating anything in packages. They are now, and they're losing their health. So um, I mean, it doesn't take you know, any. This isn't rocket surgery. You know, it's very very simple to understand. They're starting to move to a westernized world, and they're losing their health. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's shift gears towards purpose now, because this is one of the big topics that uh, you're interested in and you cover in your documentary. I'd love to get your perspective on purpose. At the moment, we grew up in this culture where we're told that, hey, you need security in your life. You need to get a job. You need to buy a house. You need to get a car, get everything in, in place. And this is, if you get all these things, then you'll be happy. And so many try to do this either they fail and you know they get depressed and uh, they they feel like they failed in life or if they do achieve it then they get depressed again because they they feel like they haven't achieved anything worthwhile that speaks to their soul i'm wondering what's your take on purpose and what have you seen in those traditional cultures that you visited yeah i think purpose um i think we take this word for granted i don't think we really think about what it means right so you know i could have one person that says, you know, uh, my purpose is to make, uh, to be the youngest billionaire. Now, are we really, do we really suspect that that's going to improve their health? You know, so I think, I, first of all, let me state that purpose has been shown to be linked with good health and longevity, okay? And that with most long living people, we do find that they have a quote unquote purpose. But I think there's some things that we're, we're overlooking when, the, when, we, when we speak about this idea of purpose. Um, I think purpose has to be tied to two things. One is meaning. So in order to have purpose, you, I think you have to have meaning. Okay, so m- meaning has to be built in. Um, and then the other component is that, that it has to be something that is life-affirming. So it has to be something that is, generally speaking, good for you or good for others or both. You know, something that, that is um, giving back, something that is... In service. It's ge- exactly. It's generally a good thing. Mm-hmm. I think this is, so if you have that, and you have meaning, then this is the purpose that we're talking about. You know, um, uh, my purpose might be to be the best police officer that arrests the most people in whatever. I don't know. Like people, <laughs> people have weird purposes. And I would not suspect that that leads to good health and longevity necessarily. 
I think it's only when you have meaning behind something that is, that is, that is for the greater good that is um, life affirming. I think that is where we see mm-hmm. good things come in terms of our health and our well being. And this is what we do. We do see this in, in, in a lot of the regions around the world where people are living a long time. We see that they have a, a communal mindset. You know, they're there in service to others uh, uh, and, and people around them. They have um, meaning uh, in, in, like I said, in God or in nature. You know, in, a, in other words, there's, there's sort of this inherent connection that's built into their lives that gives them a sense of purpose, right? The sense of, of meaning and belonging and, and all this stuff. So, you know, purpose doesn't have to be, you know, Richard Branson style purpose. Um, I think it has to be something that is meaningful to you and is of service to others. This could be a, I mean, simply put, that could be a mother, a father. So, um, you know, Vic Strecker, who is a professor at the University of Michigan, um, you know, he was telling us, he, he gets into purpose and meaning a lot in his work. And, and he was telling us a story about a janitor that was at a cancer hospital that would go around and visit some of the kids that didn't have, you know, parents that were, you know, frequently coming to visit them. So he would go visit them and keep them company and, and, and tell me that's not a life of purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, so I think we have to understand what, what we have to dig a little deeper on this idea of purpose. And I think it has to go into one meaning connection. Um, you know, this idea of giving and giving, giving yourself for the good of others for the greater good mm. in service. I think that is where we need to focus. And there's something cool about that, which is to say that it's not like you have to go seek out this massive grandiose purpose and you know life is going to suck until then. It's more, all you have to do is just find meaning in the things that you enjoy and give back and be of service to others. This could simply be smiling at the person that looks like they're having a bad day, right? Go back to the janitor story. Just do mm. something good for somebody else or something else. Cleaning up the beach, you know, while you're going for a run, cleaning up the trash, that's purposeful, that's meaning, you know, you're doing something of service. So I think we have to get out of our way a little bit when it comes to this idea of purpose and just start doing very simple things um, in good, in, in, in for the greater good and in service to others and attach a meaning to that and understand that that is the whole point of this you know, journey experience we call life is to basically provide things for other people. I mean, their all point is to give back. Yeah, you know, it's, not, it's not to take. You can't take anything with you. But and you, you do, can. you do get something in return because really, like people who are living their purpose are expressing their gifts, and that's one thing that people Absolutely. aren't allowed to investigate in their lives. Or what gifts am I born with? And gifts are something that you give to others. It's not what have been given to you. You give uh, to others. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And and I think we all have these inherent gifts and these inherent desires to be good at things and it could be words you know somebody that's just truly gifted with words or it could be comedy you know um or whatever the case is could be your art this is what we need to foster and i think it's an easy thing to do when we are able to um explore that and and attach a meaning to that right so um so i think that's really what we have to do in terms of purpose it's not like we get it we got to get out of our western mindset when we think about purpose um, it doesn't have to be somebody who's successful in business or successful in, you know, life or community or have a billion friends on Facebook. No, it's not purposeful. Well, you know? um, there's a really great book that I love by a man called Bill Plotkin. It's called Soulcraft. I'm not sure if you've read it, but um, no, it's, it's a, yeah, it's an incredible book. One of my favorites, probably my favorite book actually. And the way he talks about purpose is that the purpose is the purpose of the soul. So it's not really specific in terms of like, I want to achieve this or that. It, that, it has no specificity in that way because right. um, when it becomes specific is when it belongs to uh, the time and place. But in terms of what your purpose is, like something that you're born with, it really doesn't belong to time and place. It expresses itself in its environment in a, in a certain way. So a really good way of doing it or on, to thinking about your purpose is to thinking think about it a bit more abstract. For instance, my purpose is to feed people. And it's not really to say, like, I'm going to feed people by cooking in this restaurant. I want to be the best chef or have the best restaurant, anything like that. That's not how I see it. My purpose is to look at people who are going through their health journey, their spiritual journey, their soul's journey, and to give them nourishment and food 
and things to think about and things to take on their journey when they're looking at their health. And it's not a specific purpose for me that says, this is how I'm going to be doing it. It may express itself differently in the way that I live my life. It can change this month from next month, actually, the way that this purpose manifests itself, but the purpose is to feed people. And it's, it's, it becomes really much uh, broader and simpler to live out that kind of uh, purpose when you don't make very tangible goals around it that restrict you from ex- you know, expressing yourself in your fullness. Um, I'm right. just, yeah, like I look at you, for instance, and I, I can see that you know, part of your purpose is to bring this kind of uh, knowledge to the world and uh, reconnect people to their nature and to who they are as people. And a- absolutely. And, and I was actually going to hit on that. You know, so, uh, somebody's purpose might be to travel around the world for their own curiosity, you know, not for any other higher meaning or purpose, but just to travel around, explore, and, and get a sense for the world, and then share that through a blog or photography mm-hmm. or whatever, right? I mean, I think we just have to get in touch with ourselves and, and, and start to recognize who we are, what we enjoy, what we want to do. And then when we do that, um, you know, then these purposes or these meanings start to arise mm-hmm. within us and we start to share our gift, whatever that is, it starts to come up. So I think some of it just has to do with who, getting in touch with who we re- really are. And I think it speaks to your point and sort of the soul's purpose. You know, why am I here? You know, you, well, first you have to engage the world. Go engage the world and figure out who the heck you are and what you enjoy and what you want to do. Do that, explore that, see what pops up. And I think naturally we, we want to share our gifts, right? If I'm really good at something, I just naturally want to share that, right? So, um, so I think some of that just has to do with figuring out who we are and what we enjoy for me there's nothing worse than eating alone for instance you know that you, ha- you have to share the food <laughs> you got to share it you know so right right that's exactly. the of it. hey um there's so much to cover really you've interviewed so many different experts as well as gone around um, the world looking at these cultures that we've spoken about can you just uh, touch briefly on the types of people that you've interviewed and the different topics because this is a nine-part series um it's got what around what mm, 10, 12 hours or more? Or, uh, oh, yeah. 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 Can you just tell us a little bit uh, of the bigger picture of the series so that people know what, what to expect when they have a look at it. Yeah, it's, it's a nine-part series, and, and we kind of broke each episode um, out. It's about 12 hours overall, I'd say. We broke each episode out into various components that we thought were really important to address. You know, So we look at some of the biological mechanisms, right? We get a little gut- geeky and sciencey when we talk about mitochondria and microbiota and how those interact you know we keep we do engage the practical aspect but we we want to um, teach people about microbiota and mitochondria and why they're important so that 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 when they implement lifestyle practices they understand why they're doing it Mm -hmm. so you know we do get a little geeky in that regard and we talk about diet and exercise and and really how to approach those two things in our modern world Um, you know we talk about the environment and how that the environment you know, we can't be healthy if the environment's sick. Mm. We, we, it will reflect back upon us whatever we put out, you know, mm. into the environment. So, so we have to explore that. So we, we get into an episode, uh, an entire episode on, on the environment and what to do about toxins and how to deal with that. Um, we have an entire uh, episode on circadian rhythm and heat and cold therapy and, and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, interviewing experts on these topics as well. So. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I'll, I'll list off some of these experts, you know, but um, one episode we talk about kids, how to raise healthy kids and why important, the importance of pregnancy and birthing and, and, um, and, and breastfeeding and all that kind of stuff and childhood traumas. You know, we get into spirituality and connection and religion and, and community and how all that's important. You know, we get into how do you deal with things as we get older, you know, things like Alzheimer's and um, you know, dementia and cancers and, and, and um, you know, some of these retirement communities, you know, these type of things. How do we deal with that going forward? So mm-hmm. we can, and then we, we get into technology. You know, what technologies can we use going forward that will help us, how, that will help us get in touch with ourselves, not do things for us. So we cover a lot of stuff. I mean, we've got you know, Dr. Mark Hyman, we've got um, Tatis Karazi, and we've got Laird Hamilton, the pro surfer uh, involved. We've got Ben Greenfield. Um, uh, we've got Deanna Minnick, um, Jeffrey Bland, who's the father of sort of functional medicine. Um, Preston Smiles, you know, who's, who's a very inspirational sort of uh, spiritual guy. We've got J.P. Sears, who's a comedian, <laughs> but also, also very, very wise in terms of emotional yeah. health and that kind of thing. Um, 
you know, we got Anne Margolis, who is a, a midwife, you know, I mean, we've got so many people in this thing and there's like 90 something experts that range in so many different um, mm-hmm. specialties that we wanted to bring in the best we could to discuss various topics because um, there's a lot of nuance to some of this stuff. And so, mm-hmm. um, so there's a lot to it. And then we, and we, and we also interviewed 20 something people from around the world, you know, from the ages of 70 to 105. So you get to hear their perspectives on their life and what they think is important and how they, how their life was. So mm-hmm. we get their wisdoms, we get their experiences. And that was really probably the coolest thing is you're hearing from a 105 year old Julio, you know, who lives in Sardinia, um, mm-hmm. who, who ate meat part of most of his life because his wife liked meat, but now he doesn't eat meat because he doesn't really like it. And, it's, and the, none of the meat's good anyway in Sardinia. It's all gone to shit. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful to sort of hear these things. He's still riding his bike, by the way. Wow. Um, wow. Bike. So, wow. so it's kind of cool. Cool to see these people, see their environments, hear about their, their lives. And it starts to give you a sense for, you know, where, where we need to sort of keep some of those traditions and bring them forward and how we need to think about our new world. Yeah. Because, you know, artificial lighting is a now a, an obstacle we have to, we have to navigate for us. We yeah. don't sleep well. And our biology doesn't work well. So a lot of important things that come from the past, a lot of important challenges that we need to recognize going forward. And as technology continues to progress, we're going to have to have an understanding of how to think about this stuff Mm. or else we're screwed. We're not going to be healthy. Absolutely. I mean, a change needs to happen because things are really degrading very very fast we've got um it's estimated that one in four kids will be autistic by 2033 we've had the youngest type 2 diabetic she's a three-year-old it's just crazy where we're going now and well and and right and right now children uh in the u.s children spend less time outside than prisoners wow oh my god so that's a new yeah all right i'll I'll write that one down yeah right and 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 so you're not going to get i think the most important um if, if I were to just throw out a sort of random thought, um, I would suspect that the most important aspect of longevity is what happens between the ages of zero and 20 years old. Mm. To me, that's where the stage is set. Mm. Yeah. You know, if you do that right, you have a better shot at making it to 100 in a healthy way. If you didn't do it right, you can still recover. It's just that was a pretty significant period where you're mm. you're just setting up your odds a little bit better. So. Um, we screw that up. It's going to yeah. be so much harder to recover as we go. Let's get that right. And we have a better shot at some of this stuff. That's why it's so important to get this information out there as quickly as we can, really, because the sooner we make the change, the, the sooner it'll start happening. And uh, the thing is, a lot of people just don't have access to this knowledge. People who are going to the supermarkets, buying what they think is healthy food or living in a way that they've never been taught otherwise is being indoors and going to offices and being in their cars. They just don't right. have access to this information. A lot of them. And um, it's super important to get this out. So thank you so much for working on this and just um, putting all that effort on two years, a long time to dedicate. I'm sure you've got many years ahead of you. Of, yeah, um, of going around. Um, hey, I just want to ask very quickly, two, two quick questions. Uh, one is, how are you feeling? Are you feeling positive for the future? And number two is, what kind of changes have you implemented in your life since you've come back? And uh, what are the big things that you've changed for yourself? I'll answer that second one first, which is, um, you know, the, I think the main takeaway for me, um, because I, I'm a health practitioner, I've been doing a lot of this stuff that, you know, for a while. So I, I already knew a lot of this stuff that I'm sort of putting in the film. But one of the big takeaways for me um, that I got from sort of going around to these places is the real importance of simplicity. So we have too many things. We have too many kitchen utensils. We have too many soaps. We have too many food options. We have too many everythings. Simpl- if we can simplify our life, you have too many clothes. Simplify your life. Give away stuff you don't need. Clear the clutter. Clear the emotional clutter, the, the, the mental clutter. This is what I've been working on. Mm-hmm. I've really been trying to declutter my entire life, really simplify, simplify the foods I'm eating, the cooking methods that I'm using. You know, I mean, you're a chef, but so you might have a number of knives, but the average person probably doesn't need more than one or two knives. And yet we have like 15. It's just you know? because they're so beautiful. All these Japanese, <laughs> <knives. laughs> you know, they're just works of art as well. That's why I, can... I, 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 actually, I probably chose the wrong thing. Maybe I'll have ladles or, or, or whatever, yeah. right? Like, 
Which too many of those. That's what I've got. Right? <laughs> too much stuff. We have our crystal stemware, and it's like, my God. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So <laughs> if, I could, if I could offer one piece of advice, and again, this is something that I've been doing, just simplify everything. Yeah. Get rid of the clutter. Get rid, yeah. Go through your closet and, and look at all the, the clothes you haven't worn and get rid of those. And you're going to find two things. You're going to find you have an emotional attachment to clothes, which is really weird. You know, we, we develop these weird mm-hmm. emotional attachments. Like, oh, I might need that. I might want that. I like that. It has a, a sentimental value, whatever it is. But you don't need it. You know, yeah. get rid of it. And so, so that's something I've really been trying to do uh, along with, um, you know, one of the big takeaways from, the, from the, the elder people that we talked to was that they held no grudges. Yeah. So they maintained good relationships with those around them and they held no grudges. So I've been trying to really be cognizant of that. Yeah. You know, how can I maintain really good relationships with people? How do I hold no grudges? It doesn't mean you have to have a million really, really close friends. It just means, are there any people in your life that you, you're, you're hating? Or even if it's not in your life, you know, politics and sports and you know, fame. I mean, in the U.S., there's a lot of people that hate Donald Trump right now. Now, I'm not here to judge that or criticize it or take one side or the other, but I will say with 100% certainty, that your hate for somebody is hurting you. Yeah, it's your own burden, like, absolutely. You're drinking the poison, not them. Yeah, so we have to recognize that getting rid of those. So I've been working on a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, Did you we, slow down with uh, your life since? Have you found, because I found when I simplified it. No. It's really <laughs> no. Up, it's uh, up uh, only, only because, my, you know, yeah. I think there's a, there's a part of this. When you're following your purpose and you enjoy what you're doing, mm. like sometimes you just don't slow down. Mm. And, and, and this is the other important thing. If I live 80 years and I really do everything I can to live out my, my best life, I'm good with that. Mm-hmm. If I live 120 years and I don't do a damn thing because I was too afraid or whatever, yeah. I, it's not to me, that's not the quality of life that I want. Right? So, so I think we have to balance that. So I think following your purpose, you know, Steve Jobs died fairly early. Do we think he didn't live a, a really great life, you know, in terms of his impact on this world? I mean, You know, he's a pretty impactful dude. You know, I heard he's kind of a jerk, but also yet, maybe yet to see, yet to see what kind of impact. <laughs> right, right. For, for better or for worse. Yeah, yeah. Nevertheless, yeah. he is part of the reason that you and I are having this conversation, spreading knowledge, and spreading information. Yeah. Right. So, so we have to be careful with all that stuff. And I think, to me, it's just a point of what kind of life do you want to live? Right. So, um, so, so, so that's the slowing down is something I think. Yes, I, I do meditate. I, I do take you know meditation walk, you know sort of meditating walks and all that stuff. So you know, yes, I, I do try to slow down, but sometimes my life sort of gets carried away with all the things mm. that I'm doing. In my yeah. joint, so, so there's that. Um, the first question you asked was, "Are you positive about the future?" Oh, dude, I'm so excited. Yeah. I think we're I mean, for <laughs> for two reasons. We're in such a crazy mess right now that it can only go up from here. <laughs> We've hit rock bottom, you think, hey? That's, that's sort of the cynical side of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I actually think it can get worse. I think it probably will get worse before it gets yeah, better. Same. Um, but that, I think that's okay. I think I'm really, I'm, uh, I'm overall, I believe in um, humanity's ability to navigate challenges. I believe in our uh, capacity to overcome tremendous um, difficulties. I think the younger generations hold a lot of promise in terms of the way that they look at the world. They don't trust any of the old nonsense that they were fed, you know, in terms of ideas. They're changing the world. I think that we have a lot of good stuff to come. We're waking up, you know, I'm seeing 10 years ago, it was hard to get organic food. Mm-hmm. Now you can get it in Costco and Walmart and all these yeah. places. So, you know, we got a long way to go, but I think we've, we've reached the tipping point in terms of our awareness. And I think we're coming back around. And I think very soon, in fact, I just saw a story about some grocery store that was, going 100% organic, non-GMO. Yeah. Everything in their entire store was organic, non-GMO. And this was like a kind of a big box type of store. You know, I was like, wow, wow that's okay. pretty impressive. Mm. So, so I, I'm super positive. I, I think, I think we got a great future ahead. And at the end of the day, really what I think we need to be focusing on is our own lives. You make the choices for yourself. You don't make, you know, don't worry about other people until you've got your own stuff figured out. Focus on yourself. Focus on improving your life. Focus on how you can make yourself the best person you can be because that's contagious. That infects other people. That will rub off on other people. You know, you walking into a room in an amazing state, you know, of joy, of compassion, of gratitude, it will literally infect everybody else. Your energy will infect everybody else. So I think if, instead of 
you know, we need to be in our bodies. We need to be within ourselves and understand ourselves. And, and, and if we can do that, then the, you don't you get rid of all the fear, right? So to some degree, it's almost, I actually love your question, but to some degree, it's almost a ridiculous question, which is to say that <laughs> who cares what the future brings? I'm here right now. I choose my state, right? I choose how I behave. I choose the people I con- I, I'm in contact with. I choose what I put in my mouth. I choose what I do. So if I'm doing those things, then that's really all I can do, mm. right? The future will be what the future will be. So imagine if the entire world had that approach of, I'm going to be here right now. I'm going to be in service to others. I'm going to be in a state of compassion and health and gratitude and all the happiness. How, how quickly will things turn? Exactly. Yeah. So, so we can sit here and debate that all the other stuff and you know, argue about what, what's, what the future is going to hold. But at the end of the day, we are deciding the future right now. Yeah. So, so be in your body right now. Decide how you want to be and let the, let the chips fall where they may. So, and I think we're waking up to this idea that more and more people are starting to come around to this idea. I mean, I, I didn't have this viewpoint five years ago, 10 years ago. And now I do. So now we're moving forward individually, collectively, slowly, but surely we're, gonna, we're doing this. And I think the more conversations like this we have, the more people doing good work like you're doing, spreading this awareness, it's going to change fast. Absolutely. Jason, tell me where can people find you and the film? Um, they can find the film at human, uh, longevityfilm.com, humanlongevityfilm.com. And, um, Is it available uh, to watch at the moment? It's, it's not available to watch at the moment. We're going to actually make episode one free here very soon. So um, I, I think the best thing I would say is sign up for our email list. We actually don't pound you with email, so you know, don't worry about that. But um, you know, if you sign up for our email list, we'll keep you prized on some of the things we're doing. We'll let you know when episode one comes out for free. We may end up doing another free screening here very somewhat soon. So um, you know, if it's interesting to you to watch it for free, we will be showing it for free the entire series. Is it available for purchase? It is available for purchase, yeah. So, so if people are that interested right now, you can go and, and you can purchase a digital copy or you can produce the physical uh, okay. copy as well. So there are options there. But, um, but yeah, I think um, you know, head over to the site and just see, see what's there for you. And um, we've got a lot of cool things coming. Honestly, we, we're just getting started. So um, we're hoping to sort of build a, a really conscious tribe of, of amazing people that, that will help us um, go where we all want to go. You know, um, so th- that's probably the best place they can find me. They can find me on Facebook just you know, by searching my sort of personal, like just Jason Peral, just my name. You know, I'm happy to connect there and, and um, I try to spread as much good stuff there. I try to keep it all positive. And, um, mm. you know, th- the whole point is is to move humanity forward. And I think we're all taking part of that. And, and that's really what I want to attract is the people that are ready to do that. People are excited to do that. And um, I think we're all playing that role. And uh, that's just kind of, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Jason, you, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you for dedicating so much time and effort into this um, documentary series. Like your whole life has, uh, you know, already benefited so many people just by you creating this. I'm just so, so happy that someone did this. Thank you for coming on the show and taking the time with us. And I hope I run into you in the future and we get to geek out a little bit more as well at some point. Man. So well, thanks thank so much, you. brother. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind words and, and for giving me a platform to discuss these things. Um, my, my admiration for your work is, is the same. So keep it up and, and uh, thanks again. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst The Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of The Wellness Couch podcasts.